Um, I'm going to, this is what I'm going to talk about. So I'm going to talk about um, what people want, um, a bit about craft ubiquity and how perhaps actually, actually how craft is changing as a, and, and becoming more mainstream, um, platforms and sharing and how user behavior is changing, um, and finally, how craftspeople may succeed in this new landscape. What I've realized in, the hearing, in listening to the previous speakers is that there are different types of craftsperson, different types of crafter. Um, and the craftsperson I'm talking about is less poly of the artist. So less of the, actually probably less of the people maybe in this room and more of the people who are actually looking to make um, a living, a uh, commercial living through selling their work uh, retail uh, rather than maybe through commissions or, or, or what have you. Um, still, some might apply. So anyway, I'm from Folksy. Um, Who's familiar with Folksy? Okay, so some of you in the room. Half, just over half. Um, so, I guess, the, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a platform from which, there's no, it's not a curator platform, it's a platform which anyone can sell work that is um, 2D or 3D, uh, handmade, handcrafted. Um, and, yeah, there's no curation. It's all post-moderated. So if you don't make the work and we find out about it, you just get taken off. The thing that, the reason we set it up that way is because I, like, I wanted it to be a meritocracy. I actually didn't like, and I still don't like, um, power structures where people can't, um, where people, there's, there's people mediating. There's curators, there's people between you and the, the interested party. There's someone in the middle. Um, and I've kind of, I don't always think that's a good thing. Um, historically, I think that's been a bad thing. And the internet's been really good at getting rid of that stuff in the middle, um, which is kind of the subtext of the talk today. So that's what we do at Folksy. It causes lots of issues, actually having that kind of, that way of um, organizing the platform means that we do a lot of post moderation. There's a lot of conflict with people saying, it's definitely mine, and we go, prove it. And they go, I can't, we go, Sorry, then it's no good. Um, and there are, you know, grey areas where people say this is definitely craft, and we go, this is not our kind of craft, or it's not a craft that works for us, and it upsets people. Um, so it's not without its political tensions and stuff, but at its heart, it's, we wanted it to be fair. Um, this is what it looked like when we first launched in 2008. So this has got, uh, found this today on the, the Wayback Machine, which is the Internet Archive. It's a wonderful tool. Um, and as you can see, it kind of, to me, the aesthetic here is more, from, is more in keeping with perhaps the, the craft vernacular, which is what folks is about. It's kind of, it's about the, the hobbyists and the, the, the makers who are, who are portfolio makers, you know, they'll have careers, they'll have jobs, but they'll make stuff in their, in their spare time. Um, the actual design we got, I worked with to do this, went on to be a stellar, um, super duper famous designer called John Hicks. Um, who did lots of work with Mozilla and everything, but he, and, and he very graciously did this on a very tight budget. Um, and I still really like it. I still really kind of, the ethos, the, kind of the aesthetic kind of, for me is, is quite DIY, and I like that. Um, anyway, so that's a, a bit about folks. So we've got, um, I think, 162,000 things on the site for sale currently. Uh, roughly about a million pounds of this stuff sold every year. Um, and the average order value is around about £19. The great thing about internet selling is you, you just become awash with data. So I could just be a total stato now and just tell you all kinds of stuff about you know, how people are coming to the site, where people are coming from, um, significant referrers, insignificant referrers, you know, how many fans we've got. You've got so much data and it's, it's really fascinating to play with it. Um, but what I'm going to do is talk about the gen more general stuff. Um, so, I want to talk about the, the people who buy the kind of things that are sold on Folksy. Um, and our, our kind of bit of evidence here, but not an awful lot, it's kind of a lot of it's anecdotal and subjective. What we found is that people want unique, different, personalized things. The underlying need here is for people to want differentiators, things that they don't necessarily find in the high street store. And there's an irony there, which I'll come on to in a minute. Um, but the, that's the underlying that's the thing. Um, and they want things with, 
provenance in the story, which was mentioned this morning, uh, earlier this afternoon. What we've found in the last, since 2008, since we've been going, is that the competition for those people, for the people, for that need, has been getting stronger. So you'll be familiar with Etsy, maybe Dewanda, Amazon Market, there's Amazon now that have a handmade marketplace. Google flirted with this, so Google used to have a, a space that was a curated place for, for artisans and crafters. It doesn't any longer, as far as I'm, I'm aware. There's a whole heap load of people trying to jump on this area, thinking it's a, you know, it's a gold mine, or certainly it's a, it's a, it's a social and cultural kind of phenomenon, um, and they want to make the most of it. So it's becoming more competitive to be in this marketplace. Um, and how streets are jumping it too. So we'll, as, we, as we shop and retail more generally, you'll be familiar with like that, the notion of the term handmade has just become ubiquitous. Everything seems to be handmade now. Um, you know, cars are handmade. Uh, and you kind of wonder to what extent something is handmade. How, do the, how does the person buying this stuff know to what extent something is handmade or the person who's made it hasn't had an influence on it? It's really hard to discern that nowadays, I think. That's a really key, key point when we're coming to sell stuff, where the value is inherently in the maidenness. Um, and and it's just the term craft has become um, kind of just, I think, colonised by lots of brands and lots of people with different agendas. Um, they want the values that craft has, um, and they want that, that value to be to imbue on their own products. So this is Levi's. And if you're familiar, if you live in London, then you'll have seen the, the Levi's ad campaign last year, which was all about kind of crafted, made and crafted this new expensive line of products. Um, and together with this kind of increasingly competitive landscape, what we're seeing is like um, consumer behavior is changing too. So it's increasingly social. And that's, you know, it's a truism. We all know that. So things like Instagram are, are, are becoming places where people share things, thoughts, ideas, um, stroking behavior, it's a kind of way of just saying hello. Um, and that's where increasingly people are, it's what people are doing. So whilst it, that maybe that behavior used to be more of a minority thing in web chats and, and kind of Usenet groups back when I was in the early 2000s, nowadays that's what the internet is. The internet is primarily just a tool for communicating. And it's primarily done on mobile. So. Um, where folksy and other places, other kind of sites used to be destination sites, so people would go to them. Nowadays, far more people are just browsing. They're looking at things um, throughout their day. You know, the phone's always with them. Uh, you know, it's it's a it's not so a good thing. It's the it's it's way it is. Um, but it means is that um, we have less des less destination less destinations and goals. Um, except for Christmas and birthdays, where people perhaps have a sense of where they want to go to get something and what their partner or their friend or their family member might want. Um, and we're finding that increasingly used behaviour is more about serendipity and stuff for sale everywhere. You happen across things. People share things. People have word, word of mouth online is becoming increasingly powerful um, as a means to, to sell stuff. So... For artisans and crafters, um, and indeed all brands, you've got to kind of be where the people are. You've got to be where potential customers uh, are. Not just artists, I'm not sure, but anyway, by and large, if you want to sell stuff, then you've got to be where the people who are buying stuff are. Like there. Um, but words and images are nothing like you see here, nothing, nothing unless they're part of a story. So like, saying you need to be in those places just isn't enough. So we get a lot of people on Folksy who, who love making and are frustrated that they don't end up selling a lot. And the quality of their work is just exceptional often. It's brilliant. Um, but they don't sell a lot. And we say to them, well, how are you going about talking about your work, about framing it, about contextualizing it, giving people a sense of what, what it is? Um, and the truth is they're not doing any of that. They don't know how to do it. They won't describe it well, they won't title it well, they give no sense of the specialness, if you like, of, of the particular piece of work, its provenance and its story. Um, and consequently, um, you know, they, their sales just don't quite match to their expectations. Um, and the story is absolutely key to the success um, of selling work. 
the story in the province is absolutely central, more so than the work itself, I think. Um, and the elements of the story which we say, which, which, which we've seen uh, to be important, are skill. So, you know, actually, what level of skill? What was the, what's the particular element of craft that you employed to make this work? How does it, how, show us. You know, show me how, how you did that. It's really important. People now are incredibly interested in, in, in the problem, you know, the, the thing, how something is made. So, the, for instance, in um, the Sack Gallery in Sheffield in the last month has had an re- artist in residence who's been working with a local bakery um, and they've been bringing the bakery into the, into the gallery and actually subverting it and showing actually you know, what you can do with dough and it's pretty odd, but you can, what you can do with dough and actually but the, the power of actually making dough and baking um, as, a, as an act in itself. So the skill's really important. I wanted to show you a video actually from Sean Bloodworth who um, produced this wonderful video of Ernest Wright and Sons, the uh, metal workers, the scissor makers in Sheffield, which revolutionized, well, which certainly changed their, um, their perception as customers and they sold a heck of a lot more scissors as a result, a business that was dying out. So skill's really important. Um, the second thing, which many people think is less important or less significant or don't think about at all, is kind of what you believe in. So this is, this is a, a small brand in Cornwall that are now bought up by VCs, unfortunately, and whatever. But they started out with a very simple desire, which was to make clothes for people who are interested in cold water surfing. Um, very niche. And they were incredibly passionate about it. And they knew the history, and they, they knew the people, they knew the community, and they told the story really well. And because they believed in it, people believed in them. Yeah? really powerful, they, had, they, they really believed it. And if you don't believe in what you're doing and you can't talk about that effectively, then it makes it a lot harder for people to believe in you and for you to sell your work. Um, another element which we talk about a lot is your goal. So actually telling people where you want to get to is really important because they want to come on the journey with you or lots of them will. They want to know what that journey is about. So if you're starting out as, a, as an artisan or you've come out of you've done an applied arts degree and you want to achieve you know, X, you want to make a particular piece of work, then you need to be good at articulating that goal. Um, Kickstarter is a really good... Uh, Kickstarter actually have a very good video about how to make videos to sell stuff and to get people interested in your work. And one of them is to articulate your goal. Um, and you'll find that the successful Kickstarter projects all have that as the heart of their campaign, what they want to achieve, where they want to get to. And again, that's, that's central for, um, for crafters and artisans too. And then finally, a bit of social proof. So Jeff Soane, who sells, who uses Folksy, um, has this in, when he talks about his work, you know, he's a craftsman at the top of his game, which may not sound particularly prophetic or just impressive, but that, the Duke of Edinburgh said that about Jeff Soane um, when he bought his work. Um, and if it's good enough for the Duke of Edinburgh, then you know, maybe it's good enough for you. Um, but doing that, doing this requires skill and effort. Um, and skill and effort equals money. Uh, skill and effort, well, it can equate to money or lost earnings. It's an opportunity, there's an opportunity cost in actually pay, making time to tell, get your story right. Um, and this is where so many, for me, so many people who look to, um, look to do well fail. Um, they, just, they just fail to understand that actually they need to build a pricing model and um, they, they, they fail to understand that they're in the luxury sector. They think they're in, you know, let's just say the Primark sector, but they fail to realise that, they, that what they need to charge for their work is significantly over and above um, what they're currently charging and what, is, what they feel is a fair price. And the reason I say that is that a lot of them work on this uh, materials plus pricing, which doesn't build in profit and it doesn't build in the opportunity cost for you to, it doesn't build in the cost models rather, for you to actually build in time to do your marketing, the story and to get all that stuff right. That's a cost of sale which is really, really inherently important. Um, so if you're a cost person wanting to make 32 grand a year, kind of a very modest amount. Um, let's say you're a milliner and you're, you're selling uh, hats at £100 a piece. You can make 
three hats a day, two and a half hours, a, two and a half hours a hat, three hats a day. Um, you're making 600 quid a week and about 32 grand a year. You're charging about 13, 13 pounds an hour is, is the cost, is your hourly rate. Yeah? That's roughly, roughly right. Um, what that fails to take into account is the amount of time that you actually need to dedicate to, to this. You're not making a profit on that. That's not a profit. There's no profit there. That's just to pay for your living. It's just for you to live. You need to make a profit in order to buy all that other stuff and to build in the time and the effort required to do that marketing, that storying. It should take at least half the amount of time, unfortunately, that, it, that, your, um, that your actual making does. It's that important. So you need to be selling hats at £200 a time, not £100 a time. But if you look at it, if you're selling hats, at, if someone's willing to buy a handmade hat at £100, is it that much of a leap of faith to think they're going to buy hats at £200? It shouldn't be, should it? If you're into a bespoke hat, particular hat, crafted hat, £100, £200, your market's luxury. Then it's not the, the elasticity here is, is, you know, is great. People, you know, the price can shift quite a lot, especially if your store is good and the provenance is good and you can show them and prove the skill involved in making your thing. Don't be scared of charging more. But you need to justify that with the, with the, the story you're telling. And that's the, that's the for me, that's the, the competitive advantage that, that artisans and crafters have over some of the big brands because the big brands just they don't have an authentic voice they can't do that they can't tell that story well they can't talk about the skill involved they can't talk about the the provenance in a way that you potentially can the thing i'll say that we we say is that find a niche that you you own so i talk about finisterre here with the, the cold water surf company what's your niche we did a, a series of business workshops last year and I was really excited when I came across this one person who uh, was in the London workshop. And most people we spoke to at the time were saying, I don't know what I want to make, I just enjoy making. And this one person came to the workshop and she said, uh, I'm really into the, the swing dance scene. And I'd never, I don't even know anything about the swing dance scene. But she, she showed us a couple of YouTube clips and uh, what have you. Um, and she was saying, look, you know, I love it, I'm passionate about it. Um, and I, I've noticed that the swing dance community um, doesn't have um, anyone who makes clothes for them. And there's no one making stuff for the swing dance community. And she said, there's 18,000 community groups across England, groups that are into swing dance. Roughly over a quarter of a million people um, for whom they don't know where to get their stuff from. Don't know where to get their stuff from. And she'd done some research, she'd been around quite a lot of those groups. And she said, I want to make bow ties, I want to start off making bow ties for the swing dance community. Like super niche, we thought. Um, but brilliant. Brilliant. She knew, she knew exactly what she should do. I and mean, it's a product. She was making a product. She wasn't an artist in that sense. But she was on the path of thinking really, um, really clearly about what it took to make money from this thing that she enjoyed doing, which was making. She enjoyed making, she didn't want to rely on grants, she didn't want to rely on patrons, she wanted to be independent and to make money of her own. And I think that was incredibly profound, and I think that's really powerful. Um, and a good way to do it is to find a niche and focus on the niche. Um, um, so, find your niche, refine your story, find your voice, and you can charge proper money. And that's, you know, layman's terms, but I wanted to be provocative today. I wanted to actually put, put something out there which you could respond to and react to. Um, it might not go down particularly well with the artists, artists amongst you, but that's, that's not the world I inhabit. Thank you.